although we're in a dangerous moment, doomism is not appropriate. We can make a good future. That's still within our technical and political powers. We just have to tighten our gut and get out there and keep uh, punching at it. Hi, Vicki Robin here, host of What Could Possibly Go Right, a project of the Post Carbon Institute. And today I have such a privilege of speaking with the author of one of the most important books in my humble opinion, in the field of sustainability, the Ministry for the Future, uh, Kim Stanley Robinson. He drives his novel through a wide range of forces and threats and opportunities, good ideas and dark possibilities that make up our situation here on Earth today. And he maps one course through it, through his novel, um, and a pretty believable course through it about how we might squeak through as a civilization towards surviving and turning the corner, turning the tide by around 2050. It's not pretty, it's not easy, it's not without massive dislocation, but he insists on positing mitigations that can still work. You know, the field of, of, of future predictions goes um, from adaptation to what we cannot change, mitigation, <laughs> what we can change, and, and basically denial, like not even getting on the screen. You know, it's a little sounds a little bit like AA, but it really, you know, he's he insists that we still have time and we can't give up um, in doing the right thing and in breaking through the many psychological, social, institutional barriers to uh, doing what we know is right but seems impossible. So. As you can tell, I'm a bit of a fangirl, but I got over it enough uh, that we had a substantive conversation about the many threads in his book and where he sees them emerging today. That's the important thing. And, and he really made a case for, not, not directly like arguing for, but he convinced me that, um, that every meeting for the future needs a storyteller in the midst needs somebody who can paint the picture of the future that will in, that inspires the work that actually is the hard work that's being done by policymakers, et cetera, and decision makers, which tends to be pretty boring stuff, you know, when you try to dive into it. But so I really think him as a storyteller is a huge contribution. So anyway, a little bit about him. Uh, he's an American novelist. He's widely recognized as one of the foremost living writers of science fiction. He began publishing novels in 1984. He's published 19 novels and numerous short stories that is best known for the Mars Trilogy. His work has been translated into 24 languages and many of his novels and stories have ecological, cultural and political themes um, <clears throat> and feature scientists as heroes. And his wife is a scientist, so he knows them up close and personal. He's won numerous awards, including the Hugo Award for Best Novel, the Nebula Award for Best Novel, and the World Fantasy Award. Robinson's work has been labeled by The Atlantic as the gold standard of realistic and highly literary science fiction writing. According to an article in New Yorker, Robinson is generally acknowledged as one of the greatest living science fiction writers. His work has been described as humanist science fiction and literary science fiction. Robin him Robinson himself has been a proud defender and advocate of science fiction as a genre, which he regards as one of the most powerful of all literary forms. I think you're really going to enjoy this conversation. Welcome so much to What Could Possibly Go Right, Stan, and I really appreciate you agreeing to uh, talk with us in this context of this podcast. And I'll just say your book starts with an overwhelming crisis and a small doorway to solutions. There's a deadly heat wave in India and a newly formed UN ministry authorized by the Paris Climate Accord that represents the rights of future people and all living beings to a livable world. And what I one of the things I love is that throughout the book, we watch so many of the threads that are alive now, policies and protests, eco-terrorism, economics, lifestyle change, geoengineering and more, they just ping pong through time, all somehow muddling toward a shift adequate to avert collapse. And you weave in explanations too of 
psychology and social psychology and you give voice to the sun, you know, you, you, it's like almost everybody has a role in this story. And it's in fact, the story we're living, everybody does have a role. And the other thing I love is that you don't assume that our better angels save the day. You, you just assume we're who we are and, and somehow or another, we, we, we muddle toward um, this livable future. And so in this past year with the pandemic and anti-racist and anti-colonial movements, growing wealth gap, terrible politics, you know the whole story, it's shaken up our certainties and our assumptions. And, and so people are scanning now for meaning and direction and the purpose of our podcast really is to inter provide people who care with voices of people who've thought deeply about these issues um, to help us all orient. So anyway, here we are and uh, getting around to my basic question, Stan, which is in the face of all that is going wrong, what do you see could possibly go right? Well, thank you for this, Vicki. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak and uh, especially about the uh, things that might go right if we did them, because I really have spent my working career as a um, utopian science fiction writer. Uh, I've conceptualized it that way and I've uh, came at it from many different angles going back about 30 years now. And um, uh, inspired by my teacher and friend Ursula Le Guin, who was the great utopian novelist uh, in the generation before me, and um, my colleague from Scotland, Ian Banks. It's a rather small crowd of people doing utopian science fiction, and now it's become a kind of a necessary uh, tool of thought for thinking our way forward, uh, so that if you try to decide what things you we need to do now as individuals and as a society, it helps a lot to have an image of what we're aiming for and what's possible. So I've been doing that for a long time, but now I think the combined awareness of dangers from coming from climate change and global warming and habitat destruction, and then also the pandemic as a, a slap to the face and a realization that um, we are in a one planet civilization, that the biosphere matters, that things can go wrong fast, and that it's a, a delicate um, balancing act, a coordinated uh, set of technologies and, and social s uh, systems, all working together in an improvisational way that isn't really um, super well guided by any kind of quote world government or world coordination. We do have the UN and I want to say that amongst the inspirations for me in writing this latest book of mine and just the latest try at this effort, the Ministry for the Future, the, uh, the Paris Agreement, the Paris Agreement that was signed in um, at the Congress of Parties meeting in Paris in 2015 was a monumental achievement and um, a major event in world history because it sets up the platform for us to discuss how to go forward in dealing with all these crises. So um, I decided to base my novel around the Paris Agreement as an organizing principle at an international agency. And uh, um, then I also um, began to um, take on board the news that we can't let the Earth's temperature get very much higher than it is now without creating deadly heat waves. This so-called wet bulb temperature, um, wet bulb 35, is, it's a heat index. It's a combination of, of absolute heat and humidity. And when you get to a high enough heat and humidity combination, it's simply fatal to humans who aren't in air conditioning. And this is somewhat new. I don't think you could go back into the, uh, into the Wayback Machine more than about five or seven years, and people weren't talking about this. And quite a many um, uh, intellectuals or humanitarian, uh, humanities people, economists, were all talking about adaptation that we're simply not gonna be able to hold to the 1.5 C limit or even the 2 C limit. We're gonna shoot by that. And humans are tough, humans are adaptable. We'll simply adapt, we'll do what we need to do. 
And they didn't realize that in fact, we can't adapt to certain temperatures that we're very close to right now. So there's two things going on. We're in an emergency situation, a decade where it's an all hands on deck type situation. And then on the other hand, we have this organization, we have this uh, platform structured agreement, the Paris Agreement that, that has the right to set up standing committees. And so I have them set up a standing committee, Ministry for the Future, and my novel's organized around that. So um, that's the setup. And then looking at the, the largest problem that I could see in getting in the way of us dealing successfully with this issue, because we do have enormous scientific powers. We have technological powers. We have um, um, probably civilization is more powerful now than it has ever been by magnitudes, but we're still not succeeding in decarbonizing fast enough so what's the problem there? Well, I decided that it's basically simply a matter of money, of uh, economics, that w the way that neoliberal capitalism, which is the world order right now, it's the economic system of this world, and even China and Cuba are part of neoliberal capitalism, it rewards itself by way of profit and shareholder value, but that means profit in a different way. <clears throat> profit is, is another index that indicates that you've pulled out more value than you've put back. And um, it's okay to exploit people. It's okay to exploit the biosphere in non-sustainable ways. If you can make a profit, it's good. And that's really like the one rule that rules us all, the run rule that binds us. Um, and in that system, capital always goes to the highest rate of return. And the highest rate of return could be anything, but you but capital will not go elsewhere. So that if there was something destructive that gave you a, an eight percent return on your investment, and there was something actually quite beneficial to the biosphere and to people of the future that only gave you a six percent return on your investment, the the money would go to the eight percent. It's an right. algorithm. It's, a, it's not a, no, a law of nature, but it's a law of the currently running civilization. Right. And so therefore we're kind of, we're doomed because we're in an economic system that will not pay us to do the right things. So um, that being identified, I think, and I don't think this is controversial particularly, it's not an original diagnosis to me. I, I, I am a more reporter than I am a, an original thinker. But I saw that this was a compelling argument that we're in terrible trouble. And then I thought, well, you can't just revise all the rules of civilization in the next five years when you need to do it. So what in the currently existing system could be turned to use and overwhelm that one simple algorithm of profit? And there I came to quantitative easing. And again, I'm just reporting what a certain small slice of the um, political economy world uh, of economics and political economy has been uh, testing out ideas of their own and, and ferociously discussing them amongst themselves. But what we've all seen is that quantitative easing uh, in 2008 after the big crash in real estate and then last year with the pandemic and then last week with the giant bill from the US Congress uh, and the same things have been going on in the European Union um, is the creation of new money. And what's interesting about it is when you add the word carbon quantitative easing is that the new money is specifically designated like an earmark in Congress, specifically designated for decarbonization work first. After that, you've spent it on good things and it flows out into the economy like any other money. It's a medium of exchange, a storage of value. Uh, but the first spending of it uh, created by governments. I, I should add here, because it's really important to say this is not a cryptocurrency. This is not a private currency like Bitcoin, which is basically a scam and, a, and a, in fact, a horror, a horror movie of a scam in that it burns a whole lot of carbon to make something that's basically as valuable as tulips. In other words, it's just a speculative bubble. Uh, but uh, I'm talking about fiat money, which is to say money created by governments and backed by the central banks. So if the central banks were to get together and to say, we are gonna create 
um, like this year's bill, a couple of trillion dollars every year that go directly into decarbonization work and pays for the necessary, the things that would save us from uh, these wet bulb temperatures, the things that would begin to lower the temperature, suck carbon out of the atmosphere, uh, and also stop us from burning more carbon by way of fossil fuels. Uh, and even fossil fuels themselves would have to be regarded as a kind of a stranded asset and the nations in control of fossil fuels, of, of which we're one, and there's about 10 or a dozen major petrostates that need to know that their finances are not going to be ruined by keeping that carbon in the ground because they've already loaned off of it. They've already right. borrowed off of it. So um, the financial arrangements resemble what John Maynard Keynes had to do after World War I and uh, after the Depression and after World War II is to um, begin to use the powers of government to back money to be spent to do the right things. And we know what the right things are. So mm -hmm. it's really a matter of paying for them. Yeah, and so um, that's, I, you know, I, I'm not brilliant either, but I mean, I've been trying to go upstream and the problems that we have, you know, to find the, the spring from which flows all the things we struggle with. And of course it's, it is the design of money. And um, you know shareholder value, and uh, <laughs> I don't know if you did any research on me, but I'm I'm the co-author of a very popular book called Your Money or Your Life, which really teaches people frugality um, in service to self liberation from the work and spend hamster wheel. Uh, but it's. It, it, the system is, is still soaked in capitalism. All we're doing is teaching people to be better capitalists and capitalists who know how much is enough and value something other than money and stuff. Um, and so I'm watching in that community people grapple with the dicta of your money or your life, which is get the maximum return so you can retire early. And the, the dicta of, of social responsibility, which is, Put your money, I mean, put, your, put every financial transaction in service to the things that you think are good, true, and beautiful. Um, and it's a, you know, it's a conundrum. So I was very attuned to how you centralized um, this carbon coin uh, and you know, basically invented a system that rewards the proper behavior. So I have two questions about that. One is, a friend of mine who's also been a long time sustainability buff, you know, leader, um, observed that like a very small percentage of that $1.9 trillion is going to anything that you could call green. So we've just, you know, bet the farm on this huge stimulus without, without any push towards doing the right thing. I mean, it's doing the right thing by justice somewhat, you know, I mean, it's, there's many right things in that bill, but um, it, it doesn't drive us in the right direction. So I'm curious about where you see this idea of carbon quantitative easing actually coming into being, what, 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 what's sprouting that we could cooperate with? Yeah, um, well, I want to say that uh, I, I, I know about your project and um, it is, um, it is a, not being a better capitalist, but really being an anti-capitalist because capital is all about growth and more. And then your project was about enough is better than more because life matters more than making money, which is an index of a good life that doesn't actually work very well. This, this, this problem of the index where you put um, uh, many factors into one number and pretend that that one number properly represents all the many factors is, is one of the technical problems that we have that we're not addressing in economics. But uh, your argument that enough is um, as good as a feast as the old saying goes, one of my favorite sayings, and indeed, enough is better than a feast because a feast makes you sick. Well, this is a powerful argument. Uh, and I would also say that the, although the recent $1.9 trillion, let's call it $2 trillion, I don't know why they didn't just round up, um, 
uh, it, it's like it's like 99 cents versus a dollar yeah, exactly <laughs> just to get yeah. people to buy it <laughs> yeah yeah two trillion dollars well the amount uh poverty reduction is indeed green work and justice at the same time so there is some great stuff in the earmarking of that particular bill uh and in, but on the other hand it resembles the earlier quantitative easings in that it's a way to keep the economy liquid. It's a way to keep people out of bankruptcy. And so the fact that it did as much as it did to reduce poverty and especially child poverty is actually all, you can call that a kind of green work. And so it's a, it's a great bill. Uh, however, uh, it's true what you also pointed out or your, your uh, colleagues, there's more to be done. And Bloomberg Green has a good article about how so much of the quantitative uh, easing of the since the pandemic hit has not actually been targeted to building better as Biden used, called it in the campaign. We haven't built back better anywhere near as much as we could have. And that's a bad sign. It's been a little bit too much business as usual. But this is why one has to talk about carbon quantitative easing and the banks, the central bankers, and I'm talking about Christine Lagarde and Powell, the head of the Fed, the, the president of the World Bank, I see a hopeful sign here. They have all begun to wave their hands and say, look, we're central banks. We're here to stabilize the value of money. That's our one goal, along with helping unemployment as a subsidiary of that. We are here to stabilize money for you. But we see that if you told us to create money to be spent on decarbonizing projects, we could do it. So the invitation mm -hmm. is out there from the central bankers in a recent set of speeches that has come out since the pandemic, but even in the, the second half of 2020, I found this um, surprising. In my novel, I have my minister for the future pound on the central banks for five or 10 years to get them to agree to this. And yet here we're already seeing it. So this uh, was an enormously hopeful sign to me. If we, need to, we do need to pick up on what they're saying. And the idea of the carbon coin is somewhat technical, but it's a way of creating a carrot for us as well as the various sticks of carbon taxes and the like. Um, if you don't burn a ton of carbon, you get one carbon coin. If you pull a ton of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, you are rewarded with a carbon coin. And that could be by way that you run your agriculture, for instance. There totally. are already, yeah, regenerative agriculture pulls carbon down into the soil. I mean, that, that has a um, diminishing set of returns as your soil gets healthier and healthier, but there's a lot of room for a carbon. <laughs> a being lot of room, soil. right. Yeah. And then there's also artificial means. Um, I've been looking since I finished my book into direct air capture an industrial process for dragging CO2 out of the air and then uh, pumping it back underground. This makes the oil companies have something useful to do um, because we're really talking about billions of tons of useless uh, frozen ice, uh, uh, dry ice, frozen, frozen CO2 pumped back down into the ground. Well, that is not the highest rate of return. That would be something that you would need to be rewarded for by the central banks so that it would be real money, the carbon coin, that would be tradable on the markets. And this is the kind of the technical financial aspects of the carbon coin idea in my novel. And again, I didn't invent it. I, I pulled it out of the literature that's speculative right now, but it's being read by think tank. This idea is getting traction. It's uh, so. fabulous. Where, what other ideas do you see um, from your book that are getting traction now? Well, there's one that I wanted to bring up. Um, so thanks for that, which is the idea of leaving a lot of the land surface of the earth uh, to the wild animals. E.O. Wilson had a book called Half Earth. Right. Um, and he proposed that half of the land surface and half of the oceans be simply left empty of humans. And it was aspirational and it was also a, a kind of you know, charismatic megafauna. It was kind of a charismatic mega idea. And um, everybody thought, well, you know, he's over 90 years old. He's obviously um, become a philosopher and become too idealistic. That'll never happen. 10 years later, after the publication of that book, the European Union um, uh, and the uh, Biden administration and other organizations have talked about, we need to leave 30% of the land 
uh, empty of humans to let animals do their thing. And 30%, right now, I guess you, uh, I've read that about 15 to 20% of the land surface of the earth is in a protected wilderness status of one sort or another. So it's a big jump in that, but also humans are moving to the city and agriculture is um, changing fast. So in that combination of people naturally moving to cities and in agriculture changing from a kind of industrial roboticized process to something that's more community-based and more sustainable, less fossil fuel driven and less fossil fuel uh, fertilized, in all of these processes, you get to a situation where um, habitat corridors for wildlife are gonna help us to avoid a mass extinction event which we're on trembling on the brink of, and which would be a devastation that the future generations of humans could never recover from. Right. So um, I'm loving it. Uh, there's a Y to Y corridor, Yukon to Yellowstone. And of course, this is the Canadian Rockies. It's easy to do there. Habitat corridors where wildlife can just move freely. They're talking now about Y to T, uh, Yukon to Tierra del Fuego, that the whole spine of the Americas becomes a gigantic habitat corridor and wild animals are allowed to survive because there's so much on the brink of extinction across the board. And so when I saw those announcements and I saw that Europe has got a gigantic rewilding Europe project where they're doing everything they can to bring wild animals mm -hmm. back into Europe and big, big stretches of Europe, Western Europe are being abandoned by people um, who go to the cities because they can't make a living in the tiny villages that were in the center of Poland or the center of Spain, et cetera, in the Balkans. These, this is quite a wild continent in its um, topography. It's, uh, it's easy to make habitat once you focus on it. And when I see that that's happening too, as part of a green project, as something that, you know, you would get your carbon coin you would definitely be paid a lot of carbon coins for making habitat corridors because it would be um, creating uh, carbon sinks at the same time that you'd be saving wildlife. So I have seen that happening. It's, um, I'm kind of amazed. And there's actually been people have read my book, Ministry for the Future. Many people say, oh, so optimistic, so utopian. Other people have said to me, why do you have these things happening in the 2030s or the 2040s? They are happening now. Mm. They are happening now. And that's been uh, hugely encouraging to me. That is fabulous. I have, um, I'm going to break my own boundary and I'm going to go a little extra time because I'm these uh, two things. Um, there were two elements to the book that seemed necessary uh, in addition to the two that you singled out. Um, and um, one was the uh, geoengineering of the uh, Arctic ice and stopping the flow because, you know, as you pointed out in the book, you know, <laughs> so goes the ice, so goes the planet. You know, that, that, that seemed to be a linchpin that you portrayed as successful um, that really, is one of the save the days things. Mm. And then another is um, the eco-terrorism. And you sort of layer in a little bit that the ministry itself has this you know, black wing that's maybe engaged in that, but you have the children of Kali. And I think we see that happening now and in a sort of inchoate way, you know, whether it's the storming of the Capitol or you know, whether it's you know, the alt right or Antifa, you know, there are people who are going on the street saying this whole system is wrong and we have to stop it. Um, and that seemed to be, you know, the crash day where all the planes fell out of the air, or many of them, that seemed to be another crucial shock, you know, sort of a, and so I just would love to hear mm -hmm. your thoughts about um, the necessity of those two elements in creating enough space for the carbon coin negotiation. Yeah, well, let's, I'll go backwards order um, and, and I'll be brief, but the, the eco-terrorism thing, I hope we can avoid. I don't want to imply by my book that it's necessary. What I would say is if we don't come to grips with these problems now, then 10 years from now, there's gonna be so much suffering 
that people are going to be stupendously angry and there will be violence. If, right. It would be a good outcome if it were as targeted and asymmetrical and smart and effective as the violence that I portray in my novel, which is of a kind of a mission impossible, hit the right nerves of the rich and they will um, um, give up their ill-gotten gains type story, but also just inchoate um, uh, spasms of angry violence that don't actually accomplish very much. That's much more common and we'll see that if we don't deal. So that's what I wanted to point out in my novel. Not that we need it, but that if we don't cope well, we're gonna see it anyway and it's gonna be ugly. I don't right. wanna be in support of violence against other humans. Right. I am interested in, I'm interested in civil resistance. I'm interested in disobedience. I'm interested in even in sabotage the destruction of destructive machinery. Uh, there's a good book by Andreas Malm called How to Blow Up a Pipeline. And it's not a technical guide. It's about the philosophy of how do you resist destructive technologies that we know we can supersede already, but it's in the interest of certain private parties who are quite wealthy to keep using these destructive technologies. Well, should we stop that outright physically? This is an open question. Uh, let me leave that one because that's like the depths of right. um, endless right. uh, philosophical, a painful discussion that we do need to have. It, I'm glad you brought it up. And then the geoengineering is a very uh, speculative, hopeful thing on my part because I grew up on the beaches of Southern California. I love beach culture and the beaches are doomed because of sea level rise that uh, the heat that we've already put into the earth system is melting enough ice that sea level is gonna rise inevitably. And you only need about a meter sea level rise and all the beaches in the world of the entire earth will all be underwater and gone along with their cultures and along with their biomes. The, the biosphere at the, at the shoreline is in, incredibly rich and it will be endangered in a bad way. So I've spent two seasons in Antarctica, um, widely separated, once in 95, once in 2016. I love it there. And everybody who goes down there, well, I shouldn't say everybody, but a lot of them love it in it with a um, inexplicable love, which I think has to do something uh, with loving small town life, but also the place is beautiful. Right. So um, glaciologists said to me, you know, we have a technology for draining water out from the underside of glaciers and glaciers don't melt in the air. They slide into the sea and they melt in the ocean, at least in Antarctica, which is really the big player in this question. And they said, if we were to suck the water out from the bottom of glaciers, where it's basically melting a little at the top, sliding down holes in the ice to the bottom and then lubricating the motion, the gravity assisted motion of ice into the sea. You pull out that water on the bottom, it's like turning a water slide into a dry cliff bottom or a canyon bottom. And ice slows back down to its original speed. And I said, well, why haven't you written this up? And they all said, they looked at me like I was a fool and said, um, we don't want to become geoengineers. We don't want rocks thrown through our windows and uh, a death threats in our email. We just, mm -hmm. want to do, we just want to do glaciology. So you write it up. So I did. Now I, I vetted it with other glaciologists that hadn't given me the idea. And they said, yeah, that could work in a canyon bottom. It might not work on the side of a plane. Some, some ice in Antarctica is simply sliding sideways down into the ocean on a front that is sometimes maybe a hundred miles wide. They said there, you might not be able to stop that slide. But if you had a canyon based um, glacier like you have in Greenland all over and um, where you often have in Antarctica, they said, yeah, that should work and it would be easy to test it and find out. And we have the technology already because drilling through ice is amazingly simple compared to drilling through earth. So that's why I ran with the, uh, with the glacier plan. <laughs> well, and thank you very much. I was very <laughs> glad you did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hope yeah. it works. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, so finally, the one final question and I promise it is final. Um, to the people who are listening, because uh, we try to keep this short so that it's just one set of dishes being done that they can get something really beautiful into their minds. Um, so this, you know, Ezra Klein said it was the most important book he read, and uh, it's on Barack Obama's list. So 
are you being approached by politicians, economists? Are you being approached by decision makers to help them think through how to sell the interventions that we must, how to sell what we must? You know what I mean? It's like, how, how can a storyteller, it seems like storytellers actually put like a stake out into the future and th that policymakers can actually orient towards. So is that happening? Are people coming to you? Yes. Yes, it's definitely happening. Um, and that, partly it's this uh, Zoom world. I can join a conference in DC or um, anywhere uh, by way of Zoom. And what I think policymakers are seeing is that they need the arts so that they need to change the, the society and our culture's structure of feeling in the way that you were doing in your book on uh, um, realizing that enough is better than um, capitalist growth of money. That is a change in one's structure of feeling. And it's the arts, it's a culture that creates that change in structure. So say we already have the policies, we already have the technologies, but we're not paying for it. And we don't even have the understanding that we need to pay for it. Well, that understanding is crucial. And there's not that, as I say, my book seems to have filled a need that is not being filled adequately yet. There's not a whole lot of utopian science fiction about us successfully coping with climate change. There just isn't. And there will be more. There are young science fiction writers who are gung-ho to explore this. And now I'm kind of like the grandfather of a movement, which is great because I think it's important and, I, and no one artist can do uh, more than one artist can do, which is really not that much. So yes, I'm getting calls, I'm doing conferences, but to, what I often have to say is, um, look, I, I exist as a person, but my book, it's already there. In other words, the Ministry for the Future is my contribution. I can explicate it, but I can't really expand on it. I can hope that people read it, but I can't make them read it. And so right. um, in a way, it's like a Potemkin village. You know, people come to me thinking there's a real town there. And in fact, it's like a movie front. But um, <laughs> But I, I don't want to, I don't mean to uh, make excuses or anything. I will say that my book is my contribution and I'm happy to have made it. And I'm very happy. And I want to thank you too, that it's being read and discussed in a way that is um, unique in my career. I have never had a response to a book like I've had to this one. And it's partly the title. It's partly the content. It's partly the pandemic and the situation that we're in right now, all combining I just think people needed a story like this one. And so I've already done it from my own perspective. I got nothing more to say, but I'm very happy to encourage the process. And that's what I think is gonna be happening from now on is, is just trying to um, alert the culture to the fact that uh, although we're in a dangerous moment, doomism is not appropriate, that we can make a good future. Um, that's still within our technical and political powers. We just have to, you know, um, uh, tighten our gut and get out there and keep uh, keep uh, punching at it. Well, that's a very inspirational um, wind up, and even my cat likes it. Um, yeah, it's <laughs> so, I uh, thank you so so much for this conversation. I could go on and on and on and on and on and on and on with you. Um, I, and um, I think that it's going to really help the people who listen to it. So thank you. Oh, my pleasure. And I'm loving the sight of your cat there <laughs> yeah, and the sound. So um, uh, we have two cats that I have to keep out of the room uh, uh, because it gets a little too raucous. But yes, exactly. thank you for this. And um, I, I, um, I look forward to going forward together. Perfect. Okay. Hey, thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a five-star review so that this hopeful message can get out to more people. Check out Post Carbon Institute's Resilience website for show notes and for more guest information. Join us on Patreon and become a financial supporter of the show and for exclusive content and special online events. Thanks also to Asher Miller, Amy Burringrood, and Clara Winter of Post Carbon Institute, plus production assistant Michelle Wig from frugalityandfreedom.com.